Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. The Supreme Lord said, Shakuneya, O son of Shakuni, Bhavan, you, Vyaktam, evidently, Shrata, are fatigued, Kim, for what reason, Duram, far. Agataha have come Shanam for a minute Vishramyatam please rest Pumsa of a person Atma body I am this Sarva all Kama desires Duk Bestowing like a cow's milk. Translation. The Supreme Lord said, My dear son of Shakuni, you appear tired. Why have you come such a great distance? Please rest for a minute. After all, it is one's body that fulfills all of one's desire. So Krishna is speaking to Vikrasura. Vikrasura has been chasing Lord Shiva after receiving a benediction from Lord Shiva that anyone's head he touches would immediately die. Shiva not knowing the ultimate intention of this demon found himself in a difficult situation where after receiving this benediction from Lord Shiva now the demon wants to use it on Lord Shiva. <laughs> and he's actually attracted to Parvati, <laughs> so he wants to destroy Shiva. So Shiva is in trouble and he's fleeing from this demon who's chasing him. Now they come to an area where the Lord appears, Lord Narayan, and now he speaks to the demon and he's saying, he refers to him as the son of Shakuni. You appear tired. You've come a long What? Well, take some rest. It's important to take care of the body. So Prabhupada gives a purport. In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada comments, Before the demon could argue that he had no time to take rest, the Lord began to inform him about the importance of the body. And the demon was convinced. Any man, especially a demon, takes his body to be very important. Verse number 30. He goes on, the Lord speaks. 
O Mighty One, please tell us what you intend to do, if we are qualified to hear it. Usually one accomplishes his purposes by taking the help of others. Purport. And even an envious demon will not refuse the help of a Brahmin's potency to gain his end. Om Akyan Timidandasya Gyanarjana Sakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padekamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shcha Shri Rupam Sagrachatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Prikavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Pancha Kopa Tarubascha Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gauda Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai So the Lord is speaking very sweetly to this uh, fleeing, this demon who is chasing after Lord Shiva. And um, it's interesting how the logic he uses, because it's, uh, it's understandable that the more one is of the demoniac nature, the more one is attached to the body conception of life. <laughs> So being a, what we say, a full-fledged demon in all respects, he doesn't have any other business but demonic activities. And obviously he's very much, uh, what we say, uh, he was so, but Ed, you actually, when you go back to the, in this particular pastime, he was ready to kill his body in order to get some power. So although he was attached to the body, in one sense, he, he realized that by performing such severe austerities, he could actually attract the attention of Lord Shiva, which he did. But it was Shiva who came out of compassion for his foolish, uh, you may say, disciple. Disciple in the sense that Shiva is very merciful, and anyone who prays to him and offers worship to him he will grant some type of benediction in one form or another. So in order to save this demon from killing himself, of course he would have got another body, and the austerities he would have performed then would have gave him a very powerful body in the next life where his demoniac activities would have continued even stronger. But Shiva stopped it. And now the Lord is appealing to him your body is very dear to you, you should take rest. And Shiva, don't worry about Shiva for now, you have to take care of yourself. <laughs> so the Lord is speaking so sweetly. And this particular pastime is very much illustrated in many other discussions, and it's talked about in many circles, spiritual circles, because sometimes there's a question in the minds of some, that who's more elevated, or who is actually the supreme? Is it Narayan or is it Lord Shiva? Because there are Puranas, such as the Bhavishya Purana, Shiva Purana, and other Puranas, that also glorify Shiva as the supreme. 
but he is he's also called Bhagavan. And he also has his own sampradaya, and he is very, very much uh, powerful and very qualified in all sense to lead others. But at the same time, uh, we re of course, we were just chanting the Brahma Samhita prayers, that if you compare milk to yogurt, you compare Shiva to uh, Vishnu. And, and uh, Vishnu changed slightly, becomes Shiva. In other words, the element of Shiva, Vishnu is there, but not the full potency. So this particular pastime kind of illustrates that Shiva got in trouble and the only one who could save him was Vishnu. <laughs> so understanding the purport of this particular pastime here, we can understand that um, Shiva actually is dependent on Lord Vishnu. In other words, it's his worshipable Lord. And so that's a very important point to understand because a lot of times we come in contact with those who have that, un that under misunderstanding that Shiva is the Supreme. Although the scriptures do say that, it's mentioned for a certain class of people so they could worship Lord Shiva who could not take to the worship of Lord Vishnu and therefore they can elevate themselves from th that level to a higher level simply by worshiping Lord Shiva. And so Shiva is very compassionate and he's very merciful and he's very kind. He, sometimes he's called the father of all living entities. How does he get that title, the father of all living entities? Isn't that interesting? We might think that, that Lord Narayan or the Supreme Personality of Godhead in Vishnu form is the father of all living entities. Both statements are correct and both statements do not contradict each other. Sometimes we see when a, a statement is apparently contradictory, there is a, there's a right and there's a wrong. But in this case, both Shiva and Vishnu are also called the father of all living entities. And how is Shiva understood in that position? It's very interesting. If we go back to the, to the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the second canto, it describes that when the Lord wants to create or bring about the next creation, the Lord glances over the material energy, and which is in a, what we say, a aggregate form. All the energies within the material energy is in a, what we say, a non, it's all bunched up. They're not separate. It's like an egg. It's called Pradhan, or actually uh, uh, Haranyagarbha. And the Lord glances and when he glances, he activates, acti acti excuse me, activates that pradhan, and then everything starts to move, and then Brahma he comes in and assembles everything in the different forms, which manifest the different aspects of the material existence. So that glance is Shiva. <laughs> There's where the the point is. That glance, that Vishnu gives to Pradhan to activate the material energy. He's coming in contact, contact with his Shakti in the form of the material energy through the process of glancing. And that glance is actually Shiva. That's why Shiva is called the father of all living entities. Like that. Yeah. So back to the particular point here is that, that the Lord now wants to save his great devotee, Lord Shiva, from this, when we say this threatening de demon who is chasing him. So the Lord is speaking so sweetly. And, and Prabhupada makes the point that any person considers their body very important. Why is the body important? We may speak a little bit about that because Prabhupada says the soul exists within the body. <laughs> The soul exists within the body. That's where I am inside this body. So therefore, it has value. And therefore, it requires care and attention. But it's not me. <laughs> Just like we use the very simple example, which we all understand quite easily, is that the vehicle, a car, <clears throat> is very necessary, especially in today's world, to get one from one place to another in order to take care of one's needs and businesses. 
So the car is valuable. And therefore, in order for it to, what we say, accomplish my needs, it requires care and attention. But it's not me. <laughs> I'm not my car. <laughs> I use it and it has a purpose. So this same body also has a purpose because it can be used in the service of the Lord. And me, who exists within the body, must take care of the body in order for it to work nicely in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the demons and those in the material concept of life think that the body are them. And therefore they put all their time, energy, attention, and what we say, uh, desire, uh, energy to fulfill their desires based on this body. <laughs> So Krishna, in the form of Narayan, now is speaking very sweetly. And he's saying, don't you know how important your body is? <laughs> you know, you're running, you're tired. I can see you're tired. There's no question about that. So take it easy. And Krishna is speaking, and Narayan is speaking very sweetly, using very sweet words. <laughs> and Prabhupada makes the one-line purport. Even an envious demon will not refuse the help of a brahmana to gain his ends. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting statement. It's actually made by the disciples of Prabhupada. But the point is, is that a demon will use whatever they can in order to fulfill their desires. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who it is or what it is or what sacrifice others have to, what we say, undergo for me to, for the demon to fulfill its own selfish interests like that. So hearing the Lord, and the Lord is speaking so sweetly, <clears throat> the demon becomes somewhat attentive. And you'll go on as you go on to see what happens. And it gets, it gets even more interesting as it goes on. But there's one point I would like to bring up. You could see, this is an interesting point, and I think it was made yesterday by uh, Radhika Vallabha in his class. But I wanted to touch on it again, where we see that a great soul will show compassion to a, great, to a personality in order to give them something for their own benefit or fulfill their own desire. But that gift turns against the giver. <laughs> it becomes a source of what we say in this case, threatening life to Lord Shiva. He wanted to help the demon by not allowing him to kill his own body, giving him his, what we say, his austerity, results of his austerity. And what happens is this demon now wants to use it against his spiritual master. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Sometimes, and it happens regularly, but not often, but it happens, a spiritual master will show compassion to a person who was aspiring for devotional service. And then when that person becomes a disciple, they turn against their spiritual master. It's happened. It happens even within the society of ISKCON. They become envious of the spiritual master. They even speak badly about the spiritual master. In some cases, they even try to kill the spiritual master. <laughs> so does that mean that, that the, the spiritual teachers, what should they do in that case? Well, how can you actually perceive ahead of time? Sometimes it's perceivable the nature of a person who's coming who actually is really is not so much sincere about spiritual life but wants entrance into the circle of what we say spiritual people in order to fulfill their material needs. And Prabhupada call it Kali Chela. <laughs> Kali Chela. He's got Tilak, Kanti Mala, and Bead Bag, but disciple of Kali. <laughs> I like that. So Prabhupada, of course, warned us about that. But Prabhupada also, we see, he also, there, is one, there was one disciple of Srila Prabhupada who 
was very much close to Srila Prabhupada, actually did some personal service in the old day. But then, after some time, he came to Srila Prabhupada and said, uh, my dear Srila Prabhupada, uh, give me your blessings to find another guru. <laughs> I, he's going to guru to get another guru. <laughs> yeah. And what he wanted, he wanted a guru from Vrindavan who was teaching Rasika knowledge about the higher mellows of one's relationship like that. More like, it was like a step forward in the movement towards Sahajaism. And Prabhupada said, get out of here. <laughs> that was his response. <laughs> And then this person started to speak against Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada also responded by calling him an envious snake. <laughs> so I won't mention any names, but this happened in the early days of ISKCON and it happened a few times, not only with this one case. So sometimes you see uh, the nature of a saintly person is by nature kind. And what is his kindness? He knows that everyone is suffering. Why? Because of lack of devotion to the Lord. There's no suffering that is caused by lack of anything material. If you're, if you're missing something material, then it can be arranged, or actually, if you can't get it, actually you can still go on in life without it and still be happy and fulfill your desires. Material things don't fulfill the heart. They stabilize one's material life in the world in order to facilitate material desires and needs, but they don't give happiness. So, therefore, a saintly person knows everyone's in need, but what is their real need? That they're lost thinking that their happiness can be found in something temporary. So therefore, in his service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he's canvassing, trying to bring as many persons to the platform of surrendering to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he goes out of his way to do that. And yet, some people do not appreciate that. Sometimes we use an example to show the nature of, of how kind a certain a saintly person is. Prabhupada tells this one story where one, two men, two sadhus are walking along and they come past a little pond and in the pond there's a Scorpio, scorpion and he's drowning in the, the water. So this one sadhu wants to save the Scorpio, so a scorpion, so he picks it up and when he picks it up the scorpion bites him and he drops him and he falls back into the pond again. So again, he reaches down to pick up the scorpion to put him on the land. But as soon as he touches the scorpion, he bites him again and he drops him again. So his friend says, what are you doing? Just let him go. The friend says, the other person says, it is the nature of the scorpion to bite and it's the nature of a saintly person to show compassion. <laughs> so Prabhupada, um, totally explains that yes, even though sometimes there is some negative, still one will somehow show mercy to an unqualified person. And this is what happened to Lord Shiva. <laughs> and this is what happened to Lord Shiva. So that compassion is the, the heart of the Lord. And it's manifested through the Vaishnavas. So although Shiva is in trouble, still his intention was to somehow benefit this person or save his life anyway. But Krishna came to his rescue. See, this is, the, this is another interesting point about this, this story, is that if one is sincerely executing devotional service and one finds himself in difficulty due to that execution for whatever reason, the examples is the Pandavas. How much the Pandavas suffered, although they didn't have, there was nothing 
inauspicious, immoral, or wrong about the Pandavas. They were rightful heirs to the throne. And they were simply executing their duty to accept that position. But Duryodhana, Duryodhana and all and the other members of, that were followers of Duryodhana found them being unqualified and persecuted them in so many ways and even tried to kill them. Put them in a house of lack and put it on fire. They were saved. They were put in the jungle and chased by man-eating cannibals. They were giving a poison cake. So many things. And then Maharaj Pariksit, who was just a little child in the womb of his mother, Asvatthama tried to destroy that womb by throwing a Brahmastra. But Krishna came and saved the child within the womb. So in every case, Krishna was there to save his devotees. So sometimes we should never think that if I execute my devotional service, there'll be some loss or, or something may happen. Krishna is always there to, what we say, help his devotee. And this story, in this particular pastime, illustrates that so nicely. How Shiva, you might say, he lacked a little bit of discrimination. Could we say that? Is that an honest evaluation of Shiva? And later on, you'll, you'll, you'll hear Krishna will say, you know, Shiva, you know, be careful with these demons. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't mind helping you, but this is not my program, you know. <laughs> not that I have to get, get you out of trouble every time you get in trouble. <laughs> So the Lord was just kind of, he warned Shiva later on to be more, what we say, discriminating when giving out these benedictions. But Shiva doesn't. He, gives, he keeps doing the same thing. <laughs> because, you know, he accepts worship from, he gave benedictions to Ravana. And Ravana used those benedictions to exploit others and to also to take the wife of uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ram himself. So sometimes, and of course, Harani Kashibu was also receiving benedictions. He received benedictions from Lord Brahma in this case. So even the devas, such as Brahma and Shiva, their position is that anyone who follows a particular set of worship and becomes fixed in that worship they can receive some material benediction or some material boon from that. But sometimes it turns into causing, causes calamities for others like that. And so the Lord is actually warning. Uh, that that's what happened with, uh, with, uh, with Harani Kashipu. After uh, Nishringadev came and killed the demon, he said to Brahma, hey, now Brahma, you know, don't do it anymore. But in the next life, you know, Rani Kashipu was the first of the manifestations of Jaya and Vijaya. In the next uh, in incarnation, the Lord came as Ram, and then Rani Kashipu, who was Jivjai, now comes as, as uh, Ravana. And again, he prays to Brahma again, and again, he gets more benedictions from Brahma. There you go. So the, the demigods are not always perfect. <laughs> they make mistakes too, <laughs> like that. But sometimes they have to do that in order to fulfill the needs of their worshipers, like that. So the point here, which is I think one of the main points, is that uh, a saintly person is always very compassionate to the fallen souls. And, but one should not take advantage of that compassion and use it, just like sometimes one will deviate in their devotional service. And it says that even if one deviates in their devotional service, and breaks the principles or goes away or commits some offense. If they again take up devotional service and become fixed in devotional service, 
apichat sudarachat obhajate mamabhan, then they're rightly situated. There was one story, in the Is an Iskand contemporary story, how one young man, he was coming to one of our temples in America, he would stay for a while, do some service, and then cause trouble amongst the devotees, and then after he was asked to leave. After some time, he would return, apologize, say, give me another chance. He would come back. The devotees would give him another chance. And again, he would still do his nonsense after some time. And again, he was asked to leave. And so this went on. So finally, he uh, was told, don't ever come back again. So one time he did come back and Prabhupada was there. And then Prabhupada found out and then the temple president said, Prabhupada, we have so much trouble with this person. Prabhupada said, but Lord Nityananda is very kind. <laughs> Lord Nityananda is very kind. So we should give him another chance. So Prabhupada did. And this time, actually, the man actually changed. So by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. So this is an example of how a saintly person sometimes extend their mercy even to those who appear to be very insincere. But one should not take advantage of that. Um, and they say, take it, in other words, break the principles and then apologize and come back and then again make the same mistake again. We know Prabhupada would sometimes criticize or take issue with the Christian tradition how they have this program where people sin and then on Sunday or Saturday, it's actually Saturday, they go to the confessional, they meet the priest and they speak all their sins. The priest says, oh, yes, I forgive you. Okay, go out and be a good boy. Don't, go, don't do it again. And then next week he's back again with his list. So, and then and he's forgiven again. And so this goes on, sinning and forgiving like that. But Prabhupada said, once, okay, twice, rascal, three times, no more mercy. So in other words, one should understand that even if I am still subjected to my material tendencies, which forces me, because you know, Arjun mentions that in the Bhagavad Gita, how what forces a person to commit sinful activities even against their own will. And Krishna explains in the next verse, Kama Esha Krota Esha, Raja Guna Samud Bhavaha, Maha Shapnam, Maha Papam, Vidyeha Vihavarinam, that lust, the ever devouring sinful enemy of this world, comes in contact with anger and then ultimately everything is destroyed. So this lust in causes one to sometimes forcibly commit a sinful activity even though one... Therefore how to overcome this is that one should very carefully take an association of saintly persons and in that association follow the process very carefully then gradually one will become purified. And even if that tendency does come, in the association of devotees, one can check it. Like that. One can check it. Like that. But outside the association of devotees, it becomes very difficult to overcome these tendencies. In fact, it becomes impossible. So that's how valuable it is to associate with devotees because it helps to reduce the tendency for sinful activities and gives us entrance into the process of pure devotional service. Mm -hmm. So this point, there's many nice points here, but the main point is that a saintly person sometimes will give a unqualified person some mercy and that mercy turns into something different like that. So, <clears throat> but still a saintly person will Try to discriminate in giving it, just like it says in the uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas, that if one wants to take initiation, the requirement is that one aspires for initiation for one year, minimum. 
And in that one year minimum, there is, as Prabhupada says, mutual uh, evaluation. The disciple sees and observes his spiritual master who he's aspiring for and seeing that if that's the person he wants to give his life to take shelter of and that the spiritual master observes the aspiring disciple to see if he's sincere or she's sincere qualified and is ready to accept formal initiation like that so that's a that's an injunction that's a regulative principle mentioned and that was written by Sanatan Goswami under the direction of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How close we follow that is really quite hard to understand because there's some leadway in that principle. But generally that's the, that's the way to um, observe, to see if the person is sincere in their devotional service. But sometimes we find just like <clears throat> person gets initiated right initiation day you're just like oh you're just like full of surrender on that day uh, how much you really surrendered on that day your heart is just overwhelmed with complete supplication and surrender and you say yes Guru Maharaj no illicit sex no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. I'm going to chant 16 rounds, I promise, for this life. And if I have to come back next life, no problem. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're just like so dedicated. And then after a year, oh, 16 rounds. Oh, Krishna. Oh, my God. <clears throat> I... I I have I got a letter from one disciple. <laughs> uh, she had stopped chanting her rounds <clears throat> completely. And so then she wrote me after some time, Maharaj, I'm chanting one round now. <laughs> I said, uh, uh, you, you promised on initiation day 16, huh? and you're really proud about one? <laughs> so... See, these things do happen. <laughs> so what to do? So one should not falsely make these promises and, and then again when circumstances dictate something different. So therefore Prabhupada says that this, this vow of initiation is a vow of life. It's something very serious. And when we make that vow before the spiritual master to follow these principles, it should be seen. Now, Prabhupada did say something very power, very strong, but it was a a point of intensity and not a point of literal, literally. He said you should give up your life before you give up your vows. But he didn't want us to give up our life. <laughs> he was making the point that how this is how important one's vows are that one should be ready to give everything else up before giving up these things because these are the foundation for the successful execution of our practice and devotional service. They, they fortify the, our, our strength in devotional service by keeping away the material energy. These four regulative principles and chanting 16 rounds and even Srila Prabhupada said, if you take initiation and you say, I'll chant 16 rounds and I'll follow four regulative principles, if you do that for the rest of your life, Prabhupada said, you're qualified to go back home, back to Godhead. Every day for, for the rest of your life. That's how, what we say, spiritually potent this vow is. That's why it's seen as more important than anything else. So, therefore, in making these commitments, one should understand how that by doing this, I can, I can get the, the this complete mercy of my spiritual master, the complete mercy of the Supreme Lord, like that, like that. But sometimes we see people come to Krishna consciousness, and after some time, they, they fall away, they stop chanting, or even stop following the regulative principles. 
Sometimes we joke, yes, do you follow the four regulative principles? Yes, I follow the four regulative principles. No meat eating, no fish eating, no, no, no coffee, no tea. Four regulative principles. <laughs> what about the rest? Well, that's extra. <laughs> So yeah, sometimes you know, you know, we say people. Uh, it becomes the thing is what happens is when we lose our understanding of the process of devotional service, we also start to gravitate towards our old material ways again, and then these things become what we say attractive. Okay. So one can stay strong in devotional service by the association of devotees, reading carefully Srila Prabhupada's books, discussing these books and learning how to apply these things. That's why Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoy, Lava Mattas, La Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoy. Such a powerful statement. My, this verse was spoken by Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that the power of Sadhu Sangha when one's consciousness is fixed and hearing with submission, one can purify themselves simply by that association. One can be freed from all material tendencies. So, therefore, the point is not to take advantage of the mercy of the spiritual master and become lax in the process of our Krishna consciousness. Okay, so I'll stop here. Any questions or comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have a microphone? Mm -hmm. Or you can speak it and then I'll repeat it. <laughs> okay, in uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita, we, we come, uh, we come uh, across uh, many yogas, Siddha Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, Kriya Yoga, uh, then uh, Buddhi Yoga, many Yogas are there in Bhagavad Gita told by the Supreme Lord to come to Him. But uh, Bhakti Yoga is the easiest like, and sublime to reach God. Uh, but then why don't people uh, follow that and they uh, go uh, to Ashtanga Yoga, they do the, uh, those uh, Yama, Niyama, Asana, then they do, they do uh, all types of uh, yogic uh, processes except uh, Bhakti Yoga, even though Krishna has told it in Bhag uh, Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. yeah, Raja Vidya, Raja Guna probably, what is that? Raja Vidya Raja Guna Pravitam Idam Mutam Pavaksavam Tamam Dharma Sisukam Kartam Avyayam. It's both pleasing and it gives happiness. Why don't people take it? <laughs> when they choose something else? Well, it's a matter of understanding and it's a matter of desire also. A lot of these processes don't talk about surrender, they talk about you. You become powerful. You become able to fulfill your desires. And people like that. So taking up spiritual processes in order to fulfill material desires is very much the mood of people who look for spiritual life in nowadays. We, just like Prabhupada would say, when he was, his god brothers were preaching in uh, London and they met one Lord, Lord Brockway. And he said uh, to Srila Prabhupada's god brother, can you make me a Brahmana? And he said, yes, I can make you a Brahmana. He said, well, okay, what do I have to do? You chant the holy names of the Lord and you follow these four principles, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. And the Lord replied, impossible. <laughs> this is our life. <laughs> this is what we do. <laughs> this is what goes on as, you know, happiness. So people don't want restrictions. A lot of these other yogas, say you can just keep doing whatever you're doing and just do this also. So, but the process of bhakti is simple, you're right, it is easy. If you understand that it is a process of simply following the instructions of the Lord through 
the Lord's representative, that's all. People don't want to follow instructions. <laughs> or they'll follow what they like. like or they're just misled because thinking that, just like sometimes people say bhakti is for the sentimentalists. It's for people who are not so intelligent. <laughs> But actually, you can, if you understand our scriptures, these scriptures are the highest philosophical teachings in the Vedas, which culminates in the process of surrender to the Lord, which is the, which is the, which is the essence of the process of bhakti. So people misunderstand bhakti also. They misunderstand. Maybe even many of you who come here Therefore, you should regularly read these books, discuss these books, ask questions to get clarifications. So you don't get misunderstood about the, the actual process of bhakti, how it works, and how, it's, how I'm being transformed while, while I'm executing devotional service. So bhakti is rare because another principle, another way to answer your question is Krishna doesn't give out bhakti so easy. Because if one becomes a pure devotee, then Krishna is captured by that person. In other words, Krishna won't give himself so easily to anyone. But the mercy of the spiritual master is distributing Krishna's mercy everywhere. So that's why the spiritual master is more kind. But still, even though he's distributed and canvassing and making it simple, still people can't see the value of it. Sometimes they would rather perform great austerities thinking that's the, that's the way to go. But our austerities are basic. Just reframing from those activities which are sinful. That's all. Which cause distress anyway. I mean, is eating prashadam, is that an austerity? Anyone? It's considered to be, uh, you know, it's prashada seva. <laughs> it's service. <laughs> but to take only Krishna prashadam is an austerity. <laughs> no, no other forms of foodstuff. That's the austerity. Just accept. But Krishna prashadam is so wonderful that there's nothing about the accepting Krishna Prashadam that's austerity. So people are misled, uninformed, both about the process of bhakti and about how they can, what we say, fulfill their own desires through spiritual life. Does that help? Any other questions? Yes, Kamala. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, how can we discriminate when to be compassionate and when not to be so we don't get taken advantage of like Rikasaur took advantage of Lord Shiva? Well, it says the quality of intelligence is to see the results before the activity. <laughs> but it's not always seeable sometimes. Sometimes a person will appear to be very sincere and then do something different. So just like in the process of initiation now within our ISKCON society, only we gave initiation quite easily at the beginning. Anyone who would come, show a little sincerity, could associate with devotees and then become initiated after some time. But now we saw the results that many people go away after some time. Just like in 1976, there's a discussion between Prabhupada and one of his senior disciples. And the disciple is saying to Prabhupada, Sometimes we see we, people give, get second initiation and after some time they don't stay, they go away, they actually fall away. And Prabhupada said, now we should be very strict. Now we will have a process for 
before anyone can receive second initiation, they must take bhakti, uh, shastra, uh, what we say, accreditations. And that this was in 1976, Prabhupada said, they should study nectar of instructions, Bhagavad Gita, Sri Upanishads, nectar of devotion, like that, and become qualified tech tests. And he said 10 other small books along with it. That was Prabhupada. It's just the last few years we instituted that. Now that if you want, if you have second initiation, you have to have accreditation. Last year the GBC made a requirement, now you have to take a course in order to become a disciple. Disciples course, you know, two day course to show that you have some understanding and some sincerity like that. So the restrictions have become a little more stronger. But still, people still take advantage. Because a lot of times people don't know what bhakti is about. They think it's another form of enjoyment. <laughs> it is. <laughs> But the enjoyment comes after you actually surrender. <laughs> when you surrender, then you can enjoy. If you're not surrender, it's very difficult to practice bhakti. <laughs> so therefore they come and they, you know, they're immediately attracted by the externals. And then when it becomes a little difficult, when they're asked to do something or, or asked to give up something, it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we, all we can do is to continue to try to evaluate in the best way possible and depend on Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if a person comes and is repeated be coming to you for the same thing and every time you give it to it they take advantage of it then obviously you know you stop doing that right I think that happens in marriage a lot right oh yes I'm sorry honey I won't do that again <laughs> But what happened? <laughs> you promised last time. I know, but this time I really promised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it goes on like that. Sincerity is there, but then circumstances seem to take away from something like that. Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Okay, and today I just want to mention, today is the holiday of Christmas. And um, in the Bhavishya Purana, there is a statement mm, describing how the incarnation of Lord Jesus Christ appeared on earth for a particular mission. It's nicely described in one discourse within the Bhavishya Purana or one king, Shali, Shalivana, Shalivana, he was the king of the area. He's walking through the mountains. He sees this sadhu sitting on the mountain. He's got a golden complexion. He's dressed in beautiful white garments. He's immediately very attractive. The king offers his respects and says, who are you? He says, I'm Isha Putra. <laughs> Isha is another term for God. I am the son of God. And then this person, this great personality, starts to speak. I have come with a mission. In the, in the society of the Malechas, I will come to teach religious principles to the Malechas. <laughs> Not the, yeah, the Malechas. Malechas means those who are meat eaters. <laughs> like that. And then he explains what he teaches. He also mentions he will teach the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. He will teach the importance of controlling the senses and the mind. He will teach the worship of the sun. Mm -hmm. 
Narayan as the sun god and it goes on describing so Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned in the Puranas as an incarnation and Srila Prabhupada said he is the Shaktivesh incarnation of the Lord he, he's empowered by the Lord to preach to the conditioned souls a certain level of bhakti which is not pure bhakti but bhakti mixed with other considerations like that as Prabhupada said Jesus Christ was a pure devotee who taught mixed devotional service like that a lot of the world are not able to accept pure devotional service but they can accept something less so in order to give them a chance to practice devotional service to keep them in the house of Dharma the Lord says sends different representatives at different times to teach according to time place and circumstance and that's the history of religious principles Buddha also did the same time thing to teach according to time place and circumstance Sankaracharya also and others so this is the mercy of the Lord so this um, this Christmas Day we can honor Lord Jesus Christ as Prabhupada said he is our guru <laughs> When the Christians sometimes challenge Prabhupada, do you believe in Christ? Prabhupada said, yes, he is our guru. Why? Because he's teaching God consciousness to the fallen conditioned souls. Therefore, he is worshipable. He is a great personality like that. So they own, the, the Christians honor his appearance on this particular day. Um, so um, it's considered to be a very sacred day in that it's the appearance of a great personality in the world okay <clears throat> so thank you very much Hare Krishna Srila Prabhupada Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Transcendental Book Distribution Marathon, Ki Jai. So we are almost at the end of the Book Distribution Marathon. And uh, some few anecdotes, stories, and also few statistics about what's happening in our marathon in Iskwan Chopati. Few days back, I was uh, in Bilai, where we were doing book distribution with the bus party. And uh, things were not going so good in Bilai because uh, the estimation we had about Bilai, which is in Chhattisgarh, was completely different from what is in Maharashtra. Now, as you know, in bus party in Maharashtra, we cover almost all the villages and also go and do schools and colleges in the villages. But in Chhattisgarh, the density of population is less. So almost every village would be like four kilometers away from each other. And in every village, there would just be one or two schools. And in those schools also, teachers would have no money. So it was very tough for us to do something in Bilai because the scores were very going, going, going very down and devotees were also losing their morale. So while this was happening, we would always cheer each other that, that we should continue. Something will definitely happen. And each day, we would see that something good, if we continue persist in our book distribution, something special would happen. So I'm, talk, I'm talking about one particular day where I was there. 